evening. Well, I want to first thank uh, uh, Flame and uh, for all those that are uh, asking to uh, for those that are have chosen or are looking at uh, different candidates here at the church and uh, just having the privilege to be uh, behind what I call a sacred desk because of uh, you know such awesome teaching that we receive from Blaine and, and from others and so I uh, find it a, a true privilege uh, to be here tonight. Uh, if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, before we start. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time and opportunity that you give us. Lord, to be in your house. Uh, Lord, to be together as a covenant, co uh, covenant body of believers. Uh, Lord, that we are here to do nothing else but to praise and worship your name. Uh, Lord, the name above all names. Lord, that we are here to do no more than to lift up your name in all that we do with our singing and teaching and preaching. Lord, for our, our time of prayer. Lord, we just ask that you bless this time. Lord, we pray that this worship of ours would be a sweet aroma to you and that uh, all that we do Lord, may it be to your glory. And we ask all these things in your son's most precious and holy name. Amen. With everything that's been going on, um, you can kind of take your pick <laughs> as far as everything that's been going on, uh, whether it be, you know, the, the political fair or uh, weather or whatever, whatever it is, uh, we have definitely be coming through a lot of challenges. And that's one of the things that I want to touch on uh, tonight uh, as we go into, we're going to be in uh, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3. <clears throat> and as we look at this, as we look at turn, as you're turning to 1 Peter 3, as I said, you know, we're, we're living in this time now uh, and in the days to come, it seems like the hot button topic of the, of the or hot button word of the day is unprecedented. It seems like everything that we do nowadays that you hear in, in the, on the news, on TV, everything is unprecedented. We've never seen it before, you know. We're unfamiliar with it. It's never happened. And I think that's the, the one thing that we're getting tired of a little bit. I think we, we want a little bit more normalcy uh, in our life. And it seems like every day when we hear it, you know, you know we're, it's always tied to, you know, what is the president doing? Uh, uh, what is Congress doing? What has Congress done? Uh, what is the weather doing? How is it affecting everybody? And it's strange, you know, it, it may be strange. Uh, it may be unfamiliar, unheard of. And maybe it is, uh, especially at least to this generation, right? Um, we, we look at all the problems, global pandemic, uh, radicalized groups, cancel culture, uh, far left liberal extremism, far right extremism, uh, celebrated transgenderism, and on and on and on and on. And so what do we do with all of this? What do we do with all these day-to-day -day things that come in, that just hit us in the face each and every single day? <clears throat> we were uh, uh, blessed in the fact that our church was able to purchase these little books, the little, the little books that uh, were given out by, uh, they're written by John Calvin. And in that book, it says, it's a, uh, the title of the book's a little book on Christian life, and I believe we may still have some back there. Um, he says, In whatever trouble comes to us, we should always set our eyes on God's purpose to train us to think a little of this present life and inspire us to think more about the future life. For God knows well that we are greatly inclined to love this world by natural instinct. Thus, he uses the best means to draw us back and shake us from our slumber or so that we don't become entirely stuck 
in the mire of our love for this world, end quote. He's saying God knows how comfortable that we can become in this life. And he can and will bring tragedy uh, to bring us back to him. He will shake us from our slumber. And so when God does this, how do we respond? When God gives us this trouble, when God shakes us from our slumber, how do we respond in those times? And when people in our life see us, how do we react to that? So if you're with me on, in uh, 1 Peter 3.8, I'm going to start in 3.8, and as I always tell my Sunday school class, we're going to go to verse 15. I don't know if we're going to make it that far, but we're going to try. So follow along with me as I read. It says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the, for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life, to love and to see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear, and do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And here, Peter is addressing believers, uh, believers in the church, and that are suffering persecution. Um, and the purpose of the letter was to teach them how to live victoriously through that. And in the midst of all of that hostility, one without losing hope, without becoming bitter, trusting in the Lord while looking for his second coming. And he also answers some other very important questions in, in Peter, not, not just this little passage, but throughout the, the, the book. Uh, he says, do Christians... Do Christians need a priest for them? Do we need a priest to, to pray for them? Uh, what should be the Christian's attitude toward secular government and civil disobedience? Uh, how, can believing, how can a believing wife win her unsaved husband? And several, and several other topics that Peter touches that he helps, helps his audience, uh, the believers that he's preaching to, how to overcome and how to deal with these things uh, in people's life. But what I want us to focus on is how do we respond to this time and each other <clears throat> in our world at, that, at this. Uh, I believe verse 15 gives the overarching uh, answer. Uh, but let's start with verse 8. Verse 8, he says, Be you all of one mind, having comp compassion for one another, love as brothers, a tender heart, and humble mind. And as Christians, there should be no question of our like-mindedness concerning peace, unity, uh, brotherly love, not to be disruptive, not to, and, not, uh, and to be not harmonious. Our love for one another as fellow brothers is or should be a unanimous one in everything that we do. And of, <clears throat> of those things, we should agree. And now... Will we or do we disagree? Sure. I mean, we, we're going to disagree in things that we do. I mean, no, no matter what it is, people are, I mean, people are not of the same exact same mind about, it, about anything. You know, I'm sure there would be uh, a million and one answers if, if we decide to change the carpet or the pew colors or the painting in the walls or whatever. You know, a lot of people may disagree about those things, but Peter is telling us, that we should be those things, the things that we do disagree about, those things should be reserved um, for administrative things. Uh, those things should be reserved for budget concerns. You know, those things should be on maintenance issues, or whatever it is here at the church, but never about the things of God. 
in his love toward us, the gospel, our treatment of each other, none of those things should ever come into doubt or should we ever be uh, double-minded uh, or unharmonious or unsympathetic. We should always be kind-hearted and humble in spirit about those things. And as Christians, we have the, whole, the same Holy Spirit in us and as such, we should all exhibit the same fruits, right? And the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. These are undisputed virtues of a God-centered life and should ring out from all of us. That's why we're called to assemble together. That's why we're here at the church, to build each other up, to praise God and to build each other up, to minister to one another. That's our calling. For everybody here in church that's why we come together to assemble and to lift each other up each brother and sister up to pray for one another to come alongside and guide encourage and even discipline if necessary but always in the spirit to build back up to the body <clears throat> and so when when we're thinking about these things these things, these godly things, these godly virtues that we, sh we should have, there should never be in question uh, us, coming together, us, us not wanting to come together to be those things for each other, to each other. And those things we should never um, not be of the same mind on. In verse 9, it says, not repaying evil for evil, or reviling for reviling. On the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. This blessing here means to speak well of or to eulogize, right? We're always to speak well of somebody, not to backbite, not to argue. Um, that we should speak this blessing. And when you eulogize somebody, when, when you go to a funeral, when someone passes away, we eulogize that person or we speak good things about that person. And Peter says, we are called to this. In Romans 12, 17, Paul says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is good, or I'm sorry, what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, become, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's good, isn't it? Those words from Paul telling us how we're supposed to interact with people, how we're supposed to react when these things come, come into play in our life. You know, God gets the evildoers in the end. You know, but, I mean, let, let's face it, when our hearts, when it's our hearts and our minds that evil is being done to, we want God to get them now, right? We want God to get on top of it right then, right now. You know, like, uh, I'm a big fan of a lot of the action movies. You know, you want, you want Steven Seagal or Chuck Norris or somebody, you want them to, to smash the evil ones, right? You want to catch them at the end and, and you know, punish the evildoers and that's what we want but what does our Lord say in Luke 6 28 says bless those who curse you pray for those who abuse you you know I, I know I, I know that's hard and you know guess what the Lord knows it's hard too he knows it's hard on us he knows those things in which he's called us to do are hard things to do but he's given us a spirit not a fear but of strength and power so that we can do those things. The Holy Spirit working within us to accomplish those goals, to accomplish those virtues that God has set before us. And that's why we have the scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.16 says the scriptures are good for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Right? And so that's why we come to the Bible. That's why we read the scriptures. It's not so that we just, you know, we have a, a, a myriad of, of scriptures in our heads that we can say, you know, just a little a kind phrase or something. But it's so that when people come to us, when we're able to minister or we're called to minister to people, 
when they come to us and they say, you know, this is the problem that I'm having. I'm really down about this. I'm, I'm suffering from whatever, from depression or from a lost job or for whatever it is. We can go to the Lord's word that he gives us and we can find those answers. That's what, it's, that's what we're here for, is to seek out. Just as Justin Peters talked about the, the Bereans, that was their job, to seek the, the scriptures. Not, and, and to test the, test the, uh, the, the prophets, but also for us to, to earnestly uh, seek the scriptures in everything that we do. In verses 10 through 12, it says, For whoever des desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And Peter here is quoting Psalm 34, 12 through 16. You know, if you love life, you bless those who curse you. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace. And not just a, a one-time thing to, to pursue it, but we're supposed to chase after it. Our Christian life is an everyday, every week, weekly, monthly, yearly pursuit of righteousness. It's an ongoing uh, endeavor for what is pleasing in the sight of God. It's not just coming to church every once in a while and shaking somebody's hand and patting them on the back and saying, hey, you know, I missed you, you know, um, you know, checking to see who's in the hospital, whatever. It's, it's, it's about more than that. It's an ongoing, everyday, weekly, monthly, yearly life it's a Christian life. That's what we're living, is a Christian life. And that's what we're called to do, is to build each other up, to, to earnestly uh, care for one another. And I think, this is just my own personal opinion, but I think that uh, a lot of these mega churches, and I, I don't see anything wrong with there being, you know, four or 500 people in here, but I think when you get beyond those numbers, I think you miss that connection that we have with people. Now, I, I don't know every single person in this room, but I know most of you, and I know something about some of your lives, and you know something about my life and about my family and things like that. And, you know, when, when we have people like Troy Waters that was just in the hospital the other day, and, you know, he was thanking the church for the people doing what? What were they doing? They are praying, right? And I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you can honestly feel when people are praying for you, when people are lifting you up in prayer and just, just loving on you as much as possible. And when they see you, and when I see people in this church, they're genuinely happy to see you. And it's not just some little begrudging, oh, hey, how you doing? You know, but it's, you know, you, you're really happy to see people. I was very happy uh, to see, you know, other people that we haven't seen in months. I was, I was so glad to see Art and Trudy back when they, you know, through all of this, this pandemic uh, stuff that was going on. And there's a lot of people that were out for a long time and then they were able to come back. And, you know, and as I think as we go along, there are going to be other people that, you know, maybe have only been able to enjoy the services through YouTube or, or through whatever, that they'll be able to come back and we'll be able to do the same thing with them. We'll be able to minister and, and to, to love on them when they come back. And it's about being a part of people's lives. It's about being able to minister to people. And, you know, that's, that's all I want to do, uh, you know, in whatever capacity that is, I, that's, that's what I want to do. And I'm so glad that we're working and striving to, to do that more and more and more in this church. And I've seen that, and I'm so happy that I'm a part of that. The problem is, that we fail, right? I mean, we fail. We fail in wanting to show all those virtues. We fail in being able to minister to people around us. We fail in reacting the way people want us to react or the way people think that we should react in certain situations. We fail, but that's all right. You know why? Because God, because we have a God that loves us despite our failures. Uh, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. I, I'm so glad for that because, you know, without that, we are still dead 
in our trespasses and sin. We are still, uh, have still not been made alive. And Christ died for that very purpose. His hour had come and he, his, his time had come uh, in, when he was sharing with the disciples that his, his time had now come. And I was, um, and you're not catching all of this because I'm going back to my Sunday school class where we're studying the book of John. And it's Passion Week. It's Passion Week that we're studying. And uh, that was the time. You know, for all of those other times, they, they tried to arrest him or tried to seize him or tried to, you know, get a hold of him and make him their king. And the Pharisees are trying to kill him. And it, it continuously said it wasn't his time, but his hour had not come. You know, but uh, during that Passion Week, his hour had come. And his hour had come to do that very thing, is to save sinners like me, and all of us, and I am so glad that he did that. I'm so glad he did that for me. I'm so glad he did that for, for all of us and all those that come to know him as Lord and Savior. Moving on to verse 13 and 14. It says, Now who is there to harm you? If you are zealous for what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. When we look at society as fallen and sinful and sin-filled, the, the sin-filled place that it is, uh, even an overwhelming hateful world would be slow to hurt people who do good, who are gracious, loving, kind, unselfish, and thoughtful. So even, even you can see people, there are people that are not Christians that still try to, as they say, you know, we, we say they borrow, they borrow from, from our uh, from our stuff that, you know, they're trying to be good and right and everything, because that's what you always hear, right? Whenever so, you ask somebody, do you know the Lord? Are you a Christian? Are you saved? Or, you know, do you know where you're going when you die? And they always say, well, I'm a good person, right? I, I've never hurt anybody. I've never killed anybody. I, I don't steal from anybody. I don't, I don't cheat on my wife. You know, I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't do all these other things. And Probably the scariest words that have ever been printed ever is when the Lord looks at them on Judgment Day and says, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. And all of those things, we can be moral, we can be, you know, kind and loving toward people. But unless we have that saving, loving knowledge of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, knowing what he has brought us from and what he's bringing us to, and as Blaine has talked very many times about us being saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved later on, and that we will receive that salvation. And for the most part, the world can see and doesn't have a problem going after those who would do harm to those kind of people, right? They, they would gladly seek justice against somebody who's been hateful or, or uh, selfish to people or who, or who might steal from somebody. I mean, you know, it, 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 it doesn't take a Christian to want justice for somebody who got their belongings stole from them or that they got assaulted or, or whatever it is that happens to them. It's, it's not hard for the world, to, just the, the common world to see that and go, yeah, that, that needs, you know, they need justice. <clears throat> when we look at at widows or orphans or maybe somebody that's being taken advantage of or the less fortunate and they make themselves uh, rich from those circumstances as, as Justin Peters uh, clearly showed us these, these snake oil salesmen and charlatans that they are um, in, in his conference that, and if you missed that you, you really missed a blessing um, but if you seek to do good even a fallen world can find it hard to har harm someone like that it would be, and basically it would be Peter's contention then that one of our securities, at least, in a hostile world is to have a passionate zeal for doing good. And if that is your character, who would want to harm that kind of character? I mean, nobody's going to want to harm somebody who's wanting to do good. And at least in that world, even in a crazy sinful world that we live in, most people you can kind of hide in that security knowing that most people are not going to be out to get you if you're doing something good. But Peter goes on. Obviously, the question he poses is rhetorical. 
because no one would go after someone of that kind of life or character or at least find it difficult to justify being hateful or harmful to a person like that. And so we are called, especially us, that we are called to be a person like Christ. And that's what it is to be a Christian, to be Christ-like, to be followers of Christ and do as Christ would do, to be lovers of good, being a light to all men. And Jesus only did good for the world, and so be like Christ. But Peter goes on in verse 14, it says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. And so being, so being good and doing good is kind of in and of itself its own reward, but that isn't a guarantee that there aren't people in this world that will still try to do something to persecute you. And then even though we don't probably suffer that on a daily basis, and if we really, truly uh, live the way that we probably are, are mandated to, to live, we would probably feel a lot more persecution upon us if we walked our Christian life and walked in the way that we're, the Lord has instructed us to walk. Um, because it's so easy for us to look at the world and become a part of that, or at least look like it so that we don't feel that kind of persecution. Because nobody wants to stand out, okay? Everybody, when you get into a crowd of people, you know, if there's 50 people over here and there's two people over here, when you walk into the room, you're looking for somebody that you know, right? I mean, you're, you're like, as soon as you, you come in, you're like, oh, man, I don't know. Oh, hey, hey, there's Robert. Okay, I, there's Robert. I know him. I'm going to go, go talk to Robert. And he's part of that group, so I'm going to be, I'm going to be whatever. What are Robert's doing? Whatever we're talking about, I'm in there. That, that's what I'm doing. And it's easy for us to fall for that. You know, uh, as teenagers, as kids, we always talked about peer pressure, right? We always talked about, oh, don't fall for peer pressure. Don't do everything your friends are doing, right? If you, you know, you, I'm, I'm sure y'all heard this a million times. You know, well, if your friends are going to go jump off a cliff, would you go jump off a cliff? Of course you wouldn't, you know, whatever. And so uh, it's easy for us to fall into that. But I have found in my adulthood, there's way more peer pressure in being around the people that you work with. Your coworkers, your family, your family puts a lot of pressure on you, right? It's not just about being in school, being in high school, being in middle school or whatever. It's, it's every day. It's every day. If, you, if, you, if you're in a close-knit group like, you know, law enforcement officers, we're, we're a tight-knit group. And, you know, you want to, you don't want to be the standout. You want to feel that camaraderie. And when you're kind of by yourself standing out, you don't feel that. And so it's, it's easy for us, even, even as adults, especially as adults, to go into that, to step outside of what we know to be right just so that we can fit in, just so that we don't hear the razzing and things. And um, Scott will be the first one to tell you that their cops are relentless, man, <laughs> about different things. They, they won't let it go. I mean, something you did five years ago, the first chance they'll bring it up every single time. Oh man, you remember that time that you did so and so? Like, really, that's what you remember me from? But, um, <clears throat> and so, like we like we just said, Jesus only did good. Jesus only did good, and everything that he did, and everything that he did in his ministry, he only did good, and yet he still was crucified by a hostile world. And so just because you're good or you seek after those things that are good doesn't mean that we get a pass from hatefulness or persecution. If you go ahead just a little bit to chapter 4, 12 through 16, you can turn there with me if you like. I'm going to read it. <clears throat> if I can find 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that also, at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. 
exaltation, like jumping for joy. You can feel the joy. And if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory in God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to, but is to glorify God in this name. And so even if you do good, you may suffer no matter what. But the Spirit of God will rest on you, and God will have a purpose in all of it. Even though we don't always see that purpose, God has a plan and a purpose for anything that we go through. Uh, as uh, the book of James talks about trials and how we're supposed to face those trials. Although we may not understand, and it may or capture the reason for it, God is glorified through it, and he will be blessed. Going back to verse 15, as I come to a close, he says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And that's what Blaine was talking about, preaching about this morning, is... What are we going to have for our defense? What, what do we say when people go, well, why do you believe that, that book? That book was written thousands of years ago, written by a bunch of men that, that you know, had no education at all. There was no schools. There was nothing. Why, why do you even listen to that book? You know, their, their books are way older than the Bible. Why, why, don't you listen, why don't you pick up that book and start reading it? Why don't you live by those things? And we've got to have a defense for that. We've got to have a defense for the hope that's in us. And have a defense for the good and gracious and virtuous things that God wants us to do, to, to, to live out. For the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness that we show to everybody around us. And when we act in complete, opposition, uh, opposite, in complete opposite of the way people think that we should act when those crises and when those times hit us. And they go... What is it that you have that I'm not getting? Because there's something about you that I haven't got. There's something about the way you live your life. There's something about the way you raise your family. There's something about the way you talk. There's something about the way that you carry yourself or whatever. And I think that, above all things, is, is a good thing for somebody to look at me and say, hey, he's different. Why are you so different? Well, come on. I'll, I'll have a conversation with you. I'd love to tell you why I'm different and the, the miraculous work that Christ has done in my life and in my heart. And I shared a little bit of that with my class this morning, um, filling in for uh, Jim. And, you know, I was, I was a bad kid. I was. I was a bad kid growing up. I, I didn't do right. I barely got out of high school, uh, joined, got into the service, joined the Marine Corps. It was kind of silly. I told my mom, I said, I'm tired of you telling me what to do. I'm joining the Marine Corps. <laughs> and my mom just started laughing. I'm like, what's so funny? So, um, but, you know, I, I, I didn't learn a whole lot more in the Marine Corps about being good. Uh, and I had, that, I had that conversation with Becky this morning, you know. Um, and I hate to say it because uh, I get lost for my Christianity and my patriotism sometimes. And it's easy to do. You know, we, we get mad about what's going on either with our government or society or whatever it is and we, you know, want to pound our chest and I'm American and that's not the way things are done. And, you know, and, um, but uh, especially for veterans that, that you know, have, have sacrificed things and some the ultimate sacrifice for their country. It, uh, you know, I love this country, and I love being a veteran. I love that my son's a veteran, too. But the, the military itself, in and of itself, is not a, a, a godly, righteous place. It's not. Because you have a bunch of 18 to 26-year-old young, virile men and women that are out there that a lot of have never been away from home, have never had a paycheck, 
You know, and now in, in as long as they're not in jail, they're getting a paycheck the 1st and 15th of every month. And, you know, nowadays the paycheck's not too bad. It's a whole lot better than what I was getting paid when I was in there. But, you know, it, the Marine Corps did help me grow up. It helped me mature. But it's not a righteous place. It helps you mature. It shows you, you know, teaches you respect. It teaches you, um, you know, how to live and how to grow up and how to do different things. But uh, morally, um, you have to seek out those things. There's a lot of, there's a whole lot that's not presented to you. Uh, they have a big chapel on base, and every base that you go to, they have a nice big chapel. But it's not always, uh, you know, you don't always have a lot of people in the, in the chapel, uh, unfortunately, and you don't always have a lot of those people trying to share that message and that gospel and that hope with you, uh, which really and truly, you know, for anybody who's laying their life on the line for the country that they're serving, you would think they would want to be, you know, to the person who's ultimately in control as much as possible, uh, but you don't always find that, um, and it's sad, but... Um, you know, as, as we go through these challenging times, and, you know, 2021 just started, so, you know, it's like, buckle up, let's see what happens next. But uh, I think that uh, God calls us um, to a higher purpose uh, as Christians, and that we should show that to those around us. And Peter lays it out how we should respond, how we should act in those different things, those difficult situations. Uh, but with that... Uh, I'd like to close. Uh, you want me to close in prayer? or? Okay. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you so much for this time and opportunity. Lord, for being able to read your word. Uh, Lord, to, to study it, to uh, acknowledge the significance, the unbelievable, timeless authority that it has in our life. Lord, I pray that... Uh, you just continue to be with us in everything that we do. Uh, Lord, that we know that uh, nothing touches our life that doesn't flow through your hands first. But Lord, we, we know that uh, all of these things, good and bad, work for your will. Your good and perfect and unchangeable will. And we thank you and we praise you for that. Just go with us now and be with us this week. Lord, as we face some of these challenges. And, uh, Lord, just uh, help us to react the way we should react when we face those challenges. We ask all these things in your son's most precious and holy name. Amen.